Hey, good morning, New Day Church. It's wonderful to be back with you all again. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Kyle Slusher. I'm the lead pastor at Faith Community Church in Quincy, Washington. And before we begin, I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, the mission team that's in Mexico right now. Many of you know that your very own uh, Pastor Mark and then my dad, Pastor Jess, and Marcus Westra are on a trip in Oaxaca. In fact, Marcus is preaching the word this morning on Sunday morning. So Marcus, the Lord is with you. It's going to be a great morning. We're excited to hear about all of the things that the Lord is doing in Mexico. Our, our two churches have been doing this together for a long time, and we look forward to the continuing partnership in the years to come. So team, the Lord's with you. We look forward to having you back with us. As we begin this morning, I want to read a quote from one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, who says, If Christianity were something that we were making up, of course we would have made it easier, but it's not. You know, in Jesus' day, there were many people who were attracted to him and his ministry. When he performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000, there were many people who followed him over from Bethsaida over to Capernaum. They were attracted to the spectacular elements of the miracles that they saw. The, some were attracted because they had been fed and they, they knew they wanted to be fed again. However, when people found out what the true cost was of being a disciple of Christ, they turned away. They turned away because they thought they wanted that life, but when they actually found out what the true cost of following Jesus was, they changed their minds. Jesus says that the flesh profits nothing. It's the spirit that gives life. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. There were many people in that day, and there are many people today, who want a religion that costs them nothing. Unfortunately, there are many religions that are willing to accommodate those needs because they care more about their numbers and profits than the eternal souls of people they claim to shepherd. Because the reality is a faith that costs you nothing isn't worth anything. The difference is that Jesus doesn't offer religion, he offers relationship. The cost of that relationship is following him wherever he will lead you. So the question to many of us today is, are we willing to do that? Our main text today comes out of John uh, 6, 53 through 69, and I'm going to jump around a little bit. This is one of those Bible stories that used to really bother me because it's about a bunch of Jesus' disciples who were with him. They actually knew him. They saw him in the flesh, who up and abandoned him after a difficult teaching. Jesus is here with his disciples, and he has just performed the miracle that we had just mentioned of feeding 5,000 people. He had just walked on water. But as we will see in this story, there are two groups of disciples who had very different responses to what he had to say. And we're going to start here in verse 53. So Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I am him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the manna your ancestors ate and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while they were teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Now, for the modern-day reader, this passage should, should make some sense here. You know, we have the advantage of hindsight. We have a completed Bible. We have the gospel message. We can go back and read and understand the context of what he's talking about here. He's referring, of course, to the new covenant, something that we celebrate now in the form of communion, declaring how Jesus freely laid down his life for us, how he went to the cross for us, how because of him we have received forgiveness and the cleansing of our sin. But look at how his disciples 
responded to this teaching. Verse 60. Therefore, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, This teaching is hard. Who can accept it? The first thing that we see from his disciples, from one group of them, is doubt. We'll stop here for now just because I want to give a little historical context of what's actually going on in this passage. Early on in Jesus' ministry, his disciples were starting to have an idea of who he actually was. But they had a very different idea of what that meant. They were excited because in their minds, here was the long-awaited Messiah. They had plans for him. There was an evil Roman Empire to overthrow and a Davidic kingdom to reestablish. And they were going to be raised up and elevated as a people once more. They weren't expecting their Messiah to be the one who was going to be raised up on a cross. They were looking for a conquering king. They weren't looking for a suffering servant. Jesus didn't fit the mold they were looking for. And that is still the case for many people today. Jesus still doesn't fit nicely into their little box. And here's what we have to understand. He isn't supposed to. Christianity isn't about taking God and conforming him to our lives. It's about allowing God to transform us. So until we understand this, we will always be people that Jesus says are people with ears who do not hear and people with hearts who do not understand. So here in John, Jesus is teaching, his disciples are listening, and all of a sudden Jesus starts talking about something that without context sounds pretty darn close to cannibalism. Kind of weird. For the early disciples, this would have been hard to listen to. The Jews had strict ceremonial laws that prohibited consumption of human flesh and blood. And I'd imagine that this would have been sort of a, a cringy type of a teaching, especially if you were taking it literally. Obviously, he wasn't because he was talking about the flesh versus the spirit. Their response was, this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? In scripture, Jesus refers to himself as the bread of life. Because bread is a representation of daily need. Bread is also a symbolic representation of forgiveness throughout scripture. Forgiveness is another hard thing that God asks us to do. In, in the Lord's Prayer, it says, give us this day our daily Bread. Not only do we need a natural food daily, but we also need a spiritual food daily. Jesus' body, the bread of life, was broken for us as a reminder that we daily need to put our dependence and our reliance on him for eternal life. We need his help daily. It was a supernatural provision. Because here's the reality. When we depend on God for our daily bread... Doubt has a way of creeping in. Believing God is sometimes a really hard thing to do. Kind of like the disciples that left Jesus. It can impact our livelihoods. It can impact our standing with other people. People can begin to think that you're crazy when you're telling them that you're leaving your career job to go follow Jesus. This was my story. God asked me to leave my career with the Olive Garden that I was excelling at. I, I had helped a restaurant that was ranked the third lowest in the entire company of nearly 900 restaurants to be within the top 20% of the company. I really liked what I did. It was one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make. Uh, one of my biggest concerns was, would I be able to provide for my family working for the church? Because the church, they had been um, pastored by the same guy for 32 years. It was my dad. He's now my associate pastor. And I didn't know how that transition was going to go. I didn't know how people were going to respond to me after sitting under him for 32 years. And I remember sitting in my car outside the restaurant 
And I had gotten there really early this particular morning because we had this crazy snowstorm. And I'm sitting there in the dark, praying earnestly about my decision to possibly leave my career to work for the church. And I remember praying the typical doubter's prayer, right? God, if this is you, give me a sign. We do this. Show me that you're going to provide for me. Please show me that I'm not going to just screw this up. That was another really big concern of mine. I, I sat there and I prayed. And as I prayed, there, there was a break in the storm that I could see from where I was sitting. And I could just make out the tops of the mountains uh, behind my restaurant. And there was a break, break in the clouds and there... In the mountains above Onashi, there is a cross that somebody put up there that is always illuminated at night. And it was like a spotlight through the, through the clouds and through the snowstorm for me. And I, I remember I actually got out of my car and I took a picture because God spoke to me in that moment. And he told me, Kyle, I gave you this job. And I'm giving you the next one too. That was such a, just a blessing and a confirmation in my own life. It was God reminding me that he's the bread of life, not only for my, etern my eternity, but also for my daily needs, my daily provision. It was like God saying, I got you. I'll provide for you. Yes, this is a hard thing I am asking you to do, but I am making a way for you. It's no mistake that in this story, Jesus starts talking about the bread of life and parallels it with manna in the wilderness. Notice what Jesus says next. Verse 61, Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, asked them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to observe the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some among you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who did not believe and the one who would betray him. He said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. From that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. It says here that many of Jesus' disciples were just kind of trying Jesus out, you know, taking him for a test drive. The passage says that they didn't really Believe in him. Notice in this story how the disciples who deserted Jesus are compared to the Israelites who wandered in the wilderness. The disciples had experienced Jesus. They had heard his teaching. They had seen the miracles. They had probably even eaten the bread that he had multiplied. Jesus had just walked on water, but they left him. The, the passage here, Jesus refers to manna in the wilderness. The Israelites in the wilderness that came out of Egypt, they saw the pillar of fire and the cloud. They ate the manna. They saw the sea parted, but they still rebelled against the Lord. It's interesting that the Bible says in the book of Exodus that Israel grumbled in the wilderness. Now look what John says here. Jesus knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, asked them, does this offend you? Just like grumbling kept Israel out of the promised land, so grumbling can keep us from the kingdom. Let that sink in a little bit. Here's the point. Grumbling makes us deaf to what God would speak to us. It makes us blind to what he is doing. It takes truth and makes it an offense. Jesus says in Matthew 13, 13, this is why I speak to them in parables, because looking they do not see, and hearing they do not listen or understand. Jesus has a few disciples left. 
He says in verse 67, so Jesus said to the 12, you don't want to go away too, do you? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Revelations 2.17 says, Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. We just got done talking about Jesus being the bread of life and the manna in the wilderness. And now he is the true bread. He is living bread. And it says here, to the one who conquers. It says, God will give some of the hidden manna. In other words, God will reveal things to you that are hidden. He will reveal things and give you insight to things that require faith. He will reveal not only that he is going to get you through those hard things, that he is going to be with you through those hard things. So I want to ask you a question today. What are some of the hard things that God is asking you to conquer? I don't know about you, but I want to be the type of Christian that follows wholeheartedly after God even when he calls me to do difficult things. When I was with the Olive Garden, one of the things that we used to do to kind of uh, measure our performance, we would have what are called KPIs, which is Key Performance Measures or Key Performance Initiatives. And these Key Performance Initiatives were designed to help you get better at what you did. And so there was three measures and they were this. What do you need to start? What do you need to stop? And what do you need to continue doing? And this would give us a gauge of what our next year, what our next month, our next week needed to look like. They would evaluate a performance and say, hey, this thing right here, this needs to stop. Because if this stops, you can get to this point. Or they look and say, hey, see this thing that you're already doing? Keep doing that thing because this is going to help you in the long run. Or they would look at this thing and say, hey, you haven't done this yet. You need to start doing this because this will help your business. In the same way, Jesus is our source. Jesus is kind of like the KPI, right? Jesus is the stream. Again, quoting C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, there's this scene where in the silver chair, there's this young girl named Jill who ends up in Narnia and she's all by herself and she doesn't know where she is. She doesn't know why she's there. And she runs into this giant lion in the middle of the woods. And she is just, she's thirsty. She's part, she's, she's saying she's dying of thirst. But between her and the stream is a lion. And she asked the lion, would you promise not to eat me while I drink? And he says, no. And then she says, I'm dying of thirst. And he says, well, if you're thirsty, come and drink. And she says, I'll find another stream. And the lion looks at her, who is Aslan, who is a representation of, of Jesus, in this book says, there is no other stream. When we start looking to other streams for life, when we start looking to other streams for sustenance, all we're going to find is death. That's all the flesh can give us, is death. He says he is living water. He is the true bread. He is the bread of life. Earlier, when we were talking about hard things that the Lord asks us to do, one of the things that he asked me to do shortly after taking over as a our lead pastor here at our church, uh, he asked me to forgive somebody that had hurt me earlier in life. And it had been so long, I, I, had, I didn't think about it anymore. But he asked me... Um, to forgive somebody. 
And I didn't know that it still affected me until he asked me to do it. And the only reason I, it, it even came up is I was, I was on Facebook and I got a notification uh, of a recommendation for a friend, right? It wasn't a friend uh, request. It was like, hey, you might know this person and you should friend them. Well, this person happened to be my uh, childhood bully. And I remember seeing that and I went, delete. Like, I, I'm not, I'm not friending that person. There's no way, right? You know, take that bully out of my life forever. And um, I remember in that moment, the Lord saying, what was that? And I'm like, no, it, nothing, nothing, nothing to see here. Nothing, nothing at all. And I remember him saying that, that was, he, he said his name, that was this person. And I want you to forgive them. And I went, oh, I, I think I've already forgiven them. And he says, no, you haven't. I want you to forgive them and I want you to pray for them. And it took me several days. Uh, I'm not going to lie about that. It took me, <laughs> it took me a long time to, um, to get past that. Because it was still pretty raw. I didn't know how raw that was in my life. But I had a lot of insecurities growing up. Even through my young adult life. Because of this person. Just give you a little backstory. I, I used to lay in bed at night. Imagining beating this person to a pulp with my fists. Just, uh, just take that, you know. And I remember that it actually translated even into my dreams. I would have dreams about finding this person and just beating them up. And I remember this one night, this is what I was doing. I, I was just pummeling this person with my fists. Like, take that for all the hurt you have given me. How does it feel? And I remember just as my fist came like this and I hit him, as his head popped up, there looking back at me was a crucified Jesus. A crown of thorns on his head, blood running down his face, nailed to a cross. And in that moment, I realized that I was the one that put him there. Had nothing to do with this person I was taking my anger and rage out. It had everything to do with an inner cry inside my heart saying, I need forgiveness. And it was shortly after that, I gave my life to the Lord. It's a longer story than that, but that was kind of the, that was the trajectory of where that came from. So now years later, this is 20 plus years later, I'm in my car and I'm driving and I'm just like, Lord, I forgive him. And I meant it from my heart. I'm like, God, I, I release him. I, I forgive him. And Lord, I, I don't know where he is, but I pray that you would just be with him. I prayed something like that. Well, then I didn't think about it. This is around Christmas time. I didn't think about it for months months. I was like, I, I gave that to you. It's yours. It turns out Christmas, two days after I had prayed, he had given his life to the Lord. He is now attending church in, in another city. Um, he's doing well, and he's serving the Lord. God had asked me to do a hard thing so he could do his thing. You know, my, my, my release, my forgiveness of him, that was God freeing me. And it says that in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgiveness that we receive and for our forgiveness of others are linked God not only set me free from years of, of bitterness and anger towards this person that I didn't even know were there. They were just kind of dwelling under the surface. He not only released me from that, but he was able to take that and put this person now in the kingdom. So I just want to encourage you today. God is going to ask you to do some hard things. How are you going to respond? Are we going to be like that first group that deserted Jesus? 
Or are we going to be like his disciples that say, Lord, you have the way to eternal life. Who else will we go to? I just want to encourage you today, even amidst the hard things, there is no other stream. There is no one greater. There is no other bread of life. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. I just want to encourage you today, choose life. Choose the bread of life today, even in the hard things. New Day Church, I just want to thank you again for having me. It's always an honor to be with you and share God's word with you. God bless you. Have a great day. I see you.